I love that little girl with her finger in the pie. <laughs> well, welcome to the second week of our new message series called Growing the Pie. Now, this series isn't actually about pastries. It's about our vision for the future, our vision for the future, which is all about growing. You see, Jesus told his disciples that they needed to grow the pie, so to speak, by making more disciples, many more. And the Bible tells us that one day in the future, the church will be a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation, language, people, and tongue. And based on that vision, we here in our parish, we developed a vision statement as well. And it's all about growth and a sense of belonging. And here's what it says. We strive to be a community growing in faith where everyone loves to belong. And we're unpacking that vision statement for you over the course of this series. And last week, we talked about the first word in that statement, which is we. And we said that we are the people of God. We all are the people of God. And no matter who you are, you belong with us. Because church is a movement of people all moving in the same direction. But we also said that we need leaders. We need leaders to move that movement forward. But not just any kind of leader. We need leaders who follow the principles of Jesus. Because Jesus taught his disciples a very radical concept called servant leadership, which is based not on power and authority, but on humble service. Because Jesus himself came not to be served, but to serve. Now, obviously, leadership is a burden, especially under that model of service, right? But every time you take a step in the direction of leadership by serving someone else, you not only lift up your own spirit, but you're moving us closer to that vision of a great multitude for God. Here's the thing about vision. Vision is great when it's light outside, when you can see very clearly, there's no fog, right? You can see far and wide. Vision is great. But when it's dark and when it's foggy and you can't see very well, vision is harder and yet all the more necessary. And that's when we need faith, when it's dark. I remember when I was a kid, my family vacations were usually camping trips because my dad was cheap and he liked to save money. But we would go camping all the time. And um, I, I always remember those awkward moments in the middle of the night when you had to go to the bathroom and you had to go out in the woods alone at night in the dark <laughs> alone as a kid, right? And even a flashlight with a flashlight, it was weird, right? And it was in those moments when my faith really grew because I'll tell you, I was praying a lot every time I heard a rustle in the leaves. But see, that's the thing about faith. Faith is kind of like putting on night vision goggles. Faith is the ability to see in the dark. And so this week, we're looking at another word in our vision statement, which is faith. Because we want to be a community growing in faith. And we're going to talk about what that means in our times right now where things seem a little murky. So about 1,500 years ago, around 500 AD, the world was plunged into a kind of spiritual and cultural darkness during a period called the Dark Ages. After the fall of the Roman Empire the Western world, there was a lot of chaos in the Western world. And, you know, warring tribes started vying for power. Kingdoms rose and fell almost overnight. Violence was common. Civilization broke down and, and um, hunger and famine and accidents and disease made life brutal and short. And the culture, culture and the art started to decline, as did scientific inquiry and intellectual achievement and technological advancement. It wasn't a good time. 
Now, I'm basically an optimist. I hope you know that about me. But I know a lot of smart people who think that we're kind of entering into another period, uh, another dark period, another kind of dark ages right now in our world. There seems to be a general crisis in meaning. There seems to be a general crisis in meaning. And, you know, facts that once were not disputed are now, you know, debatable. Moral principles that once were absolute now um, are no longer absolute, but relative. We don't even seem to have a shared vocabulary uh, in some instances that we can talk with one another. There's a general loss of civility, and I don't know if you see it too, but, but a loss of social cohesion. I think it's pretty clear in our society today. And even the supposed once bastions of, our neutra of neutrality and objectivity are breaking down. The media, you know, has devolved into echo chambers and no one seems to be in the middle. And universities are packed with students taking courses on postmodern nihilism, nihilism, philosophical skepticism, scientific positivism, and a lot of other isms that I think are pretty destructive. And even reason itself is called into question. And let me tell you, when you start denying rationality, you are denying the very ground of our humanity. And it's in times like this that we need, in times of darkness, that we need vision all the more. And it's in times like this that I am very grateful for our faith because it seems like it is the last thing that offers some real answers in the midst of confusion and darkness. You see, our faith believes that truth, there is such a thing as truth, and that truth can be known. Our faith believes that, that science and reason and religion together can overcome ignorance and superstition and brutality. Our faith believes that, that the beauty of the arts reflects the perfect order of creation by a creator. And our faith believes that, that human goodness points back to a perfectly just God and an objective moral order. You see, faith, when it's properly understood, overcomes blindness and darkness. And in the, the story of Bartimaeus, I think, this week in the gospel, really suggests a way forward. I stapled these wrong, really suggests a way forward, a way back, actually, from the abyss of decline. Now, in the story, Jesus is passing through the city of Jericho with his entourage. He's also with a sizable crowd. They're on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. It will be his last journey to Jerusalem. And a man named Bartimaeus, a blind man, is sitting on the roadside begging and Bartimaeus must have sensed something unusual was about to happen. He must have sensed that something big was about to happen when Jesus approached. You know, I would think that in his circumstances, being blind, and in, that time, in those times when you were blind, you were reduced to destitution. There were no charities. There were no welfare agencies. Um, you were reduced to poverty. And I would think that in those circumstances, Bartimaeus would have very easily fallen into despair. He would have lost hope. But not here. We, we hear in this story of Bartimaeus a story of hope. His heart is moved as he hears Jesus approach. He has a sense of wonder. He must have thought to himself, could this be the day when everything changes for me? You know, I think it's human instinct to, to seek the truth. And the quest for truth always begins with a sense of wonder about the world and our place in it. As a young boy, I remember 
lying next to a roaring campfire in one of those many camping trips our family went on. And I would stare up into the dark space, into the, the sky above, that black sky, that expanse of a black space above with those billions of tiny luminaries lighting up the sky. And I would just wonder, do you remember doing that? Seeing the night sky and being filled with wonder. I have a friend who, who firmly believes that one of the most profound things he can do to renew his faith from time to time is spend a day at the planetarium. Because he says that contemplating, contemplating the, the seemingly never-ending expanse of the universe and our tiny place in it fills him with a sense of wonder and the belief that there has to be something more and that this all just can't be an accident. And so filled with wonder, Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. But many people rebuked him and told him to be silent. He's filled with wonder. He's ready for it. And then people are telling him, stop. Aren't there so many voices in our world today that try to squelch our sense of wonder, the belief that things can be different, the belief that things can be better? Many voices trying to squelch that. Just turn on the news story. Any news uh, story on the news and you'll see it. It's all about cynicism and polarized opinions and victimization. And it's easy in, in an environment like that for us to become, uh, to lose perspective on our faith, to forget what life is all about, and, and to lose perspective on, and to become disconnected with our values and what we believe. It's so easy for that to happen in this environment of cynicism and skepticism and voices trying to squelch our wonder. You know, as children, remember that as children, you were filled with wonder. You probably see that in your children or grandchildren. You were filled with wonder. You could see, sense God, and the world was a big place and a beautiful place. Children have a, a natural um, relationship with God. They don't have to try. They don't have to force it. They just believe that God exists and and, and they have a natural relation. There have been studies on this that show this. But as we grow older, we fall into, you know, survival mode. We become preoccupied with day-to-day -day living and all the things that we have to do. And we lose that sense of wonderment that we once had as a child. And the rock-solid belief that there was a God who loves us unconditionally. And so, with hope and wonder, Bartimaeus would not give up. He called out again, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And he finally got Jesus' attention. And then he asks him that question. What can I, what do you want me to do for you? What can I do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine, just imagine with me for a minute, if you were standing right in front of Jesus and he asked you that question, what do you want me to do for you? How would you respond? Bartimaeus didn't have to think, he knew. He said, Master, I want to see. Isn't that what we all want? Really deep down, don't we want to see, to really see, to finally see and have some answers to, to the heart's deepest questions? That, you know, that the, the questions that every person who's ever been filled with wonder has asked. Who am I? Why am I here? Who made me? Where am I going? What is the meaning of life? What's the path to happiness? When will there be an end to suffering? When will there be an end to this aching feeling deep down of loneliness and emptiness? See, when we encounter Jesus, our hearts are filled with wonder again. And then the Bible says that Bartimaeus got up 
and he followed Jesus on the way. And once, so once our hearts are filled with wonder again, and once we have the faith enough to ask the deepest questions, the most dangerous questions about life again, just digging below the surface of our daily living, then we have the desire to know more and we become explorers on the way to truth. And we follow Jesus like Bartimaeus. The courage to wonder again, to ask the most profound questions, believing that there are answers, and the willingness to follow the master bring us back from the brink of meaninglessness and despair and cures our spiritual blindness through the gift of faith. You know, it was faith that, that kept hope alive during the dark ages. In the bleakest period of human history, monks in isolated fortresses hunkered down and they painstakingly transcribed many copies of the scripture and the ancient writings of the church fathers. They didn't want to lose them and they locked them away in deep, dark dungeons until a better day when faith could flourish again. Today, faith still has the vision to guide us through the dark night because faith tells us that truth can be known, that beauty can be more than just individual preference, and that goodness actually means something. The Catholic intellectual tradition has always believed that faith and reason go hand in hand. Catholics love science. This is the biggest myth that's out there. Yeah, we've had a few rocky points in our history. I get it. But throughout Catholic history as a whole, it is clear that science and religion have gone hand in hand. In fact, do you know who was the first to promote, to discover the Big Bang Theory of the universe's origin that is now accepted by every almost every single reputable scientist on the planet. Do you know who that was? George Lemaitre. Do you know what his day job was? <laughs> he was a Catholic priest. Catholic priest. Church loves science. Faith and reason go hand in hand because, because faith allows us to believe what reason could never dare. And reason allows us to understand what we believe, and why we believe it. Our vision is to become a community growing in faith. And in our school, and in our children's faith programs, and in our adult faith offerings, and in our small groups, and in our message series, we affirm that reason and revelation, theology and philosophy, Science and religion, faith and rational understanding support each other. And it all begins with wonder. Next week, my leadership team and I are headed out to Baltimore. We're going to study a church that we admire. It has an amazing Sunday morning children's faith formation program. We already have a great faith formation program, but this is on Sunday morning. They have a children's program. We're going to be studying them. We've been waiting to do this for six months now. We're all so excited. We're going to go there. We're going to spend a few days. We're going to dream. We're going to wonder about what could be here, how we can get this started here. We're going to ask deep questions, questions, hard questions of that church, and we're going to map out a journey ahead. And so I think it's only fair that we ask you to do the same thing this week. Do one thing this week that feeds your soul and your sense of wonder. Maybe you could get a screensaver like the one that I have. I don't know if you could see it up here. Do we not have that? No? Okay. <laughs> there, I have a screensaver and it's not on me. It is this blindingly beautiful picture of Andromeda, our neighboring galaxy. Just a hop, skip, and a jump over you know, 2.5 million light years away. You can see it clear as day. 
And every time I look at it, I wonder. <laughs> or maybe you, you could do something else. Maybe you could look through the telescope on a starry night or examine a grain of sand through the microscope. Maybe you could head up to Mere Woods, just make reservations, and lie on your back, and I dare you to try to see the top of one of those redwoods in wonder. Maybe, and if you're able, you know, just actually get down on your hands and knees and play, actually play with your children and grandchildren. Like, don't watch them play. Play and enter into the wonder with them. Watch a sunset and don't look at the sun. Try to feel the earth move beneath your feet and remember that you live on a planet that is hanging in midair. Whatever you do to spark that sense of wonder, take a moment and ask God the big questions of your life. And then let him lead you on a journey of faith. Because it is then we will all be able to see through the dark of night.